at Bethel Presbyterian Church. As always, we have a theme, and of course the theme this morning, if you've read your bulletin, had a chance to do that, is Christ is our rock. That's a great theme, and one that we should often refer to. The scripture references from Deuteronomy, the 32nd chapter, for I proclaim the name of the Lord, Ascribe greatness to our God, the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are just. A God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteousness and upright is he. Indeed he is. So I'm going to open. I want you to meditate on this, and we'll begin our service. Mighty God, our Heavenly Father, you are our rock. You are the rock that endures everything. You are the rock that cannot be moved. You are the rock that we are to base our foundation on. And Lord, we, we, we want to worship you today in spirit and in truth. So help to prepare our hearts and minds to do so. Please continue to pray. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, making my footsteps firm. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and will trust in the Lord. Again, it talks about a new song, so let us join together singing our hymn of adoration, a wonderful Savior, hymn number 175. 175. Please stand to sing. Hideth my soul in the cleft of the 
the rock that shadowed the thrice-thirsty man. He hides my Let's praise our almighty God. Mighty God, our heavenly Father, we come today in, to worship you and to adore you. How much you have done for us. How beautiful you are. How glorious you, the, the glimpse of heaven must be that it has been seen by some as John saw in his revelation. Lord, we, we think of, of what it must be like to be in your presence. And Lord, we know right now in this place, the veil is as thin between this world and the next as it will ever be. And Lord, we ask that you, we would worship you today in spirit and in truth. We would love you with all of our hearts, knowing that we can only do that through the blood of Jesus Christ and the power of the spirit within us. Lord, thank you for all that you have done that we could come today to worship and adore you. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated. We've been trying to talk to some people in our family, doing some witnessing. It's always tough. One of the things I think that is being not understood is the holiness of God. It's tough to, to grasp that, especially for a person who has not been in the church. So, but if you do understand the holiness of God, then the next thing you have to understand is the tremendous gap there is, the, the, uh, the an unbridgeable gap between his holiness, his perfection, and our lack thereof, our what is commonly called sin, but not in some churches today. Our corporate prayer of confession, one that we're going to read together, as I read it, was struck by a theme, and that theme is coldness and indifference. And I have to confess, and I know that my brothers do as well, that there are times when we examine ourselves and we find ourselves woefully lacking in our love for Christ. So as we pray this together, I pray that you would make it your prayer. Then we'll have a time of silence and then I'll close. Let's pray together. Adorable Jesus, we acknowledge our vileness, our worthlessness, our ingratitude. With shame and confusion of face, we look up unto you. O bleeding lamb, for having slighted your goodness and your loving kindness toward us, take away this earthliness from our minds, this coldness from our hearts, this insensibility to the things of God. Preserve us from a secret alienation of heart, from a growing lukewarmness. You are the rock of ages, the everlasting strength. Endue us with power from on high overcome all our indwelling corruptions, which, like a thick cloud, intervene between our soul, you, the sun of righteousness, and thus prevent the rays of your consolation from gladdening our hearts and making us to abound in the fruits of righteousness. To whom can we look? To whom can we go? But to you, O friend of sinners, Lord, at your sweet call, we come for pardon peace and holiness. Lord, we are solely grieved that we love you so little, that our affections move so slowly toward you. Stir up our languid desires, inflame our cold affections, set our whole soul on fire with holy love. How painful that we should be so little affected by our agony and sweat, the cross and passion of our suffering redeemer. Why are not our souls all on fire when we think of your love? Why are we not melted into tears when we think of our dying Savior? Are we harder than the rock of Horeb? Are we colder than the northern ice? Lord, smite our rocky hearts with a rod of your loving kindness. Dissolve our frozen affections by melting beams of your grace. O oh, blessed Jesus, we praise you for such infinite love, such abounding grace to the chief of sinners. Amen. Please continue to pray.
Mighty God, when we consider this week all the things that we could have done, perhaps should have done, things that we have indeed done and that we should not have done, Lord, we are truly sorry. Lord, we desire that we have a spirit of repentance, and a repentance means a turning from sin, that we would place it behind us, and we know that it will haunt us. Lord, you say that you have chosen to remember our sin no more through the, through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. How wonderful that news is. Yet, as we examine our hearts, as we have gone through this week, have we been any different than the people who don't believe in you? Have our, has our heart been really warm toward you as we've prayed throughout this prayer about coldness and indifference? When we think of your sacrifice... When we think of what it must have been like to have been in front of that cross, would we have been jeerers? Yes, we probably would have been. We probably would have looked up and said, just as others did, he saved others, but he can't save himself. Oh, how little did they know that you were sacrificing yourself so that we could come to you today with contrite hearts. Lord, we don't, we don't want to be the Ephesians. Lord, they had good doctrine, but you said in, your, in, the, in, in Revelations that they had lost their first love. Lord, kindle within us that passion that we had of our first love when we first knew you and we first understood what you have done for us. Rekindle that fire. Lord, we don't want to be like the Laodiceans either, who are lukewarm. There were many things that were said that were good about this church, but these churches in Revelation, most of them were not, had lacking. And that is one thing we do not want to be, is lukewarm. So Lord, again, kindle within us a desire for you, a desire for holiness, a desire for holy living, a desire to read your word, a desire to, to bring it within us and live it out. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen. If I can assure you that if you have confessed your sins, that you, as we know in Scripture, that, that he is eager to forgive us. He will forgive us because he said he would. Continuing in Psalm 40, the next very verse that we, from the opening one. How blessed is the man who has made the Lord his trust and has not turned to the proud nor to those who lapse into falsehood. Again, how blessed are we who have made the Lord our trust. So if you're trusting in the Lord, I can assure you not again by anything that I can say, but on the authority of scripture that you are indeed forgiven. So let's celebrate that by singing to him, the great hymn of the church, Rock of Ages. We all know it, hymn number 499, hymn 499. Please stand to sing. Rock of ages left for me, let me hide myself in thee, let the water and the blood from thy ribs. from its guilt and power, not the labors of my hands can fulfill the law's demands, could my zeal no respite know, could my tears forever flow, all for sin, not atone. Thou must save, and thou alone. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to thy fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, oh, I die. Draw this fleeting breath, then mine eyes close in death. When I soar to worlds unknown, see thee on thy judgment throne. 
And all God's people said, Amen. Please be seated. The Lord continues to lead us this morning from Luke chapter 6, verse 47. The passage reads, Everyone who comes to me, says Jesus, and hears my words and acts upon them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation upon the rock. And when a flood rose, the torrent burst against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. As God's people, we've been saved by grace in Christ. He's the rock of our salvation. But you know what? That rock is of little benefit to us if we're not relying upon that rock, if we're not, if we're not resting upon that foundation. And so it is natural in this time of dedication to come and, and say, Lord, we are relying upon you for our forgiveness. Give us the grace to rely upon you now practically. Sometimes the hardest faith, as you know, is not saving faith. That's a gift of God, not a result of works. No one should boast. But it's practical faith. It's trusting God. It's waiting upon him in time in difficult circumstances. So this is a time where we can wait upon God in time. And regardless of your circumstances, to say, oh God, give me the grace to be strong. Don't turn down the heat of my life, but grant me the grace to endure the heat, which in your goodness and grace have brought me th uh, into and through. So spend this time dedicating yourself unto the Lord. Um, we're going to do that in a variety of ways. The first way will be through giving. And lest you think that that's just a way to fund a ministry, there are more efficient ways to fund a ministry than just giving in this way. Um, and, and so, why do we do it? Well, because God calls us in Scripture to give. It's, it's a part of a biblical worship uh, service. And thus, it, makes it, it should make us all sad that to see this trend in the church to throw it out because we're afraid of what it might look like. Brothers and sisters, giving is an integral part because anyone can sit here all day long and say, God, take me. But to actually place something in a plate and wait place in there does not matter. But to place something in that plate, recognize, is a part of you. So if you place a penny in there, you're saying, Lord, this is my life. It represents me. And I, as an act of faith, give this in this plate, just like I'm giving you my future. Just like I'm giving you my cancer. Just like I'm giving you my, my job or my situation. I have no strings attached uh, to this. I have no say on how this penny will be spent, but I just give it to you freely. Brothers and sisters, that's how we're called to give ourselves into the Lord. So this morning, as the plates are passed, pray and give yourself to the Lord unreservedly, unconditionally, promptly, and sincerely. With the ushers, please serve us.
Let's pray. Father, what a delight it is to be called by your name. But how scary a thing it is to be in the hands of an awesome God whose purpose and um, kingdom go beyond this world. So, Lord, we, we come to you this day and we say, Lord, take us. Take these gifts which represent us. Take us and use us for a holy purpose and a holy calling to your glory and namesake. God, we give you ourselves regardless of what that means. But we also pray with this prayer. Lord, please give us the grace to remember this prayer. When you should bring us through bitter providences, treacherous waters, harsh seas. Give us the grace, O oh Lord, to know that you're answering the prayers that we've uttered so many times. God, make me holy. Make me a man or a woman of God. And use me for your glory. God, so we can give ourselves to you this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. We read these words. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. This is a common theme in Scripture. Paul in Romans 15 says the same thing. Join me in my ministry here by praying. Um, you see this throughout God's word. This idea of joining people investing in people, having those people be a part of you. Um, and that is why it's very appropriate to speak about church membership. Church membership is not a way to, to track people's names. I hope you see that. But rather, it's, it's a vehicle by which God enables us, through the taking of a vow, to be blessed in fulfilling the obligations God placed upon us regardless of that vow. And what that vow is, what that obligation is, is our obligation to one another. To love each other. To walk with each other. Sadly, today the church has become a, um, a show in many ways. It, it's become a big business. And in the process of it, we've lost the idea that the church is but a gathering of people called by God out of the world who have committed themselves to God and each other to walk with each other, to encourage each other, to pray for each other, to bear each other's burdens um, until he calls us home. Church is a, is, is a lifetime commitment, not a Sunday activity. It's a commitment to a body. It's the willingness to say, I want to be a part of your life. I want to help you raise your kids to love Jesus Christ. I want to help you love Jesus Christ when the bitterness of life comes upon you, and it's coming upon us all. That's what church membership is. This morning, there's a brother in our body who um, understands this and has a desire to make formal a commitment to the Lord and to you, to walk with you, to minister with and to you, and by God's grace, if the Lord should allow, to die with you. And uh, Matt, Aiden, most of you know him by now, which is a wonderful testimony of his desire to minister to you and your desire to minister to him. So he's, he's going to come forward and take vows of membership this morning. I'd invite him to please come forward now, as well as the other pastors in his body. Brother, I'm going to ask you these vows, but I'll begin it by saying we, we thank God for the grace that he's given you to not only profess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but to profess your passion and desire to minister to this body and walk with us and grow with us. In light of that, let me ask you these questions. Do you believe the Bible consisting of the Old and New Testaments to be the Word of God and its doctrine of salvation to be the perfect and only true doctrine of salvation? I do. Do you believe in one living and true God in whom eternally there are three distinct persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, who are the same in being and equal in power and glory, and that Jesus Christ is God the Son come in the flesh? I do. Do you confess that because of your sinfulness 
you abhor and humble yourself before God, that you repent of your sin, and that you trust for salvation, not in yourself, but in Jesus Christ alone. I do. Do you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your sovereign Lord? And do you promise that, in reliance on the grace of God, you will serve him with all that is in you, forsake the world, resist the devil, put to death your sinful deeds and desires, and lead a godly life? I do. And do you promise to participate faithfully in this church's worship and service, to submit in the Lord to its government and to heed its discipline, even in case you should be found delinquent in doctrine or life? I do. Brothers and sisters, this is not a vow, but we would like to ask you or invite you, not yet, but I'll tell you when, to stand with Matt, to express your ongoing willingness to pray with and for him, to walk with him, and to endeavor to, ins- to strengthen and encourage him in the faith. If you uh, want to do that or express that uh, to him, please stand. Don't feel like you have to. Uh, a two. Family of God, this is your brother. Brother, this is your f- a family. Uh, young, old, help us raise our kids. Walk with us and let us help you uh, love your wife. And if God should so bless, raise, you, raise your kids. Indeed. Would you pray, Ken? Mighty God, our Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to add to our number in this way. Lord, it's, it's great to be able to have to meet a young man like Matt who has a wonderful testimony, a a testimony that he has been knowing you for years, that you set your mark upon him, and so that today he could stand here and say these vows with all of his heart. Lord, we're we're reminded when we hear these vows of our own vows and how important they are, that how important it is to be a part of this body. Lord, we thank you for all these people that are standing before us that they are all willing to, to be a part of Matt's life. And Lord, we know that, that there will be times when we will step on each other's toes. And Lord, I want to be characterized, this body to be characterized by one of forgiveness, that we would, we would ask forgiveness of each other, and that would be granted. Lord, strengthen Matt in all that he, he plans to do, his marriage and his life. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Brother, we give you the right hand. A fellowship in the name of our Lord, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Family of God, I invite you to turn in your hymnals to hymn 690, uh, 689, Pete, Be Still My Soul, 689. Be still, my soul, the Lord is on your side. Bear patiently through cross of thee. Leave to your God to order and
Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> the Lord continues to lead us and direct us this morning. Listen to 2 Thessalonians 2. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. The word uh, traditions here is the same word that we get the word uh, confession. That's what's being meant here. Hold to the doctrine, the truth of God's word. Um, which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. Our calling, brothers and sisters, is to hold tight to the truth of this God's word, to hold tight to his word, and to be a people who are founded solidly upon the rock of Jesus Christ. And therefore, it's appropriate for us now to come in this time of fellowship to his word for fellowship with him, instruction with a heart to submit and a desire to obey. And uh, so let us do that this morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. First Thessalonians chapter 1, as well as in your bulletin, is that outline that's there weekly. Please turn there with me as well and use that to take notes. Follow along as we study God's Word together. 1 Thessalonians 1, 2 through 10 Beautiful introduction as Paul is praising God and giving the reason why he's thanking God for the Thessalonians. And um, we've been walking away through this. We're going to look at it this week and then next week, Lord willing, we'll wrap this up. But for this morning, we'll be looking specifically at verses 5 and 6 as we walk away backwards through this beautiful passage. This is God's word, and as it is God's word, the word of a holy God. And by that we mean an other deity, this, this, this being which is so unlike anything we understand on this side of the grave. This is his word, and as such, it's appropriate for us out of reverence and respect to stand um, at the reading of his word. Please stand with me. Hear now the word of, of your king. We give thanks to God always for all of you making mention of you in our prayers, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith, labor of love, steadfastness of hope in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the presence of our God and Father. Knowing, brethren, beloved by God, his choice of you, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction just as you know of what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. You also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. 
For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth, so that we have no need to say anything. For they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Thus far, the reading of God's word. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, what a delight it is to read your word this day and, and now to have the prospect of feasting upon it during this time of, of feasting, this meal. Lord, we, we, we pray you indeed would enable us to eat. Give us a hearty appetite this morning. One that would keep our minds from wandering and drifting. One that would keep us transfixed upon your word and your grace and your calling that you've given us in Christ. Lord, give me grace to preach, your, therefore, your word with accuracy and fidelity. And use this, O oh Lord, to build up the body of Jesus Christ to accomplish your work and your will at Bethel Presbyterian Church and beyond. We commit this time now to you in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> The beginning of things can be very um, important. For example, think of the space shuttle entering into Earth's orbit with the plan to, to land. You know, if, if it's off a half of an inch, that could mean miles and miles on the Earth's surface. Think of, of, of birth. Think of a traumatic thing that can happen at the beginning of a person's life and how that can impact them for the rest of their life, how we can determine the course of a person's life from the very beginning. Truly the beginning, or what we've called the foundation, that which determines what a structure is going to look like, that, can de that does indeed set the pace and the course of everything else. This morning, we've been looking last week, and now this morning, we're looking at the foundation, or the cause for why this church at Thessalonica was the way it was. Now, we haven't gotten to the way it was yet, really. That's next week, verse 3. But we're looking at all the different things that led to this church being what it was. I've got a little illustration there in your notes of a temple. It was founded upon bedrock. That's the foundation, the, the uh, foundational creed. And then it's, it's, its actual foundation, which is then laid, which determines the structures, what we're on now. We looked at the infrastructure, the walls. Um, and then we've seen from afar what that structure looked like. This morning, we're going to continue looking at this foundation. It has six footers. You know what a footer is? A footer is what you, 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 you pour this big... Um, thing of cement upon hopefully solid ground, bedrock uh, would be the, uh, the best. And that is what then supports and determines the structure, where you place them. So we're looking at six different footers. We've seen three. The first three are one, the glorious reality of election. Second Thessalonians 2, God had chosen them from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. This church was going to, to be the church God wanted it to be because it pleased the Lord. However, God uses means. And that means is through the, the second aspect of the foundation. That was solid teaching. Healthy churches, biblical churches, rest upon the solid teaching of God's word. Did you get that? And it doesn't rest upon people. I gave you that quote a couple weeks back of how um, sadly, um, one generation um, is, is filled with a passion to serve God. And then the next generation of leaders focuses on keeping their jobs by keeping the ministry going. Brothers and sisters, ministry is not founded upon people or personalities. It's founded upon an eternal word, the word of God. Thus, leaders come and go. People come and go. The elders, I am ex certainly, I'm expendable. But the ministry of Bethel Presbyterian Church will continue on insofar as this ministry is built upon, founded upon God's word. Thirdly, we saw divine, we saw divine enabling. 
It's the Spirit of God working by and with His Word that brings about spiritual growth. And because of that, we saw last week, we closed last week with this incredible cry of the heart, Lord, transform us. We were clinging unto God, knowing this third um, uh, foundational element leads us to being a people of great devotion and dependence upon God. Not man, not our own weapons of warfare, not our own wisdom, not manipulation, not politicking, but God and his word and his spirit. So those are the three we've seen. This, this morning now we turn to the fourth of six, and let's pick it up with verse 5c, personal conviction. Notice with me 5c. We'll begin at verse 5. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and then the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. That word full uh, conviction is a strong word in the Hebrew or in the Greek. It means supreme fullness or certainty. It's then this strong word, this, this word speaking of fullness of, of assurance. The idea of, of an unwavering a conviction. It's coupled with the word full, polis which then makes it emphatic. We could translate it as, our gospel came to you with complete, supreme fullness of conviction. Now, admittedly, this could be in reference, verse 5, those three phrases, our, our, our gospel came to you not only in word, power, Holy Spirit, and, and conviction. All of that could be referring to Paul's preaching. The text is not clear. So it could refer either to Paul or it could refer to the Thessalonians. If you look at the bigger context, though, it, you'll, you'll see that it makes better sense that this is in reference not to Paul's preaching, but to how the Thessalonians received it. Notice with me verse 4, Paul was praising God because he knew they were, they were saved. How did he know they were saved? Because he preached the word so devoutly? That doesn't save a soul, brothers and sisters. He knows they're saved for a variety of reasons because the word of God, or because, notice verse 5, the gospel came in reality, but also it came with three things, power and the Holy Spirit. We looked at that last time. That means it indeed changed them. It transformed them. There was a divine enabling which changed them. They, they turned to God from idols. And their life was completely transformed. That's what he means here. Man, I know you're saved because first, God's word transformed you. And then secondly, would you notice here, it came with full conviction. Not on the part of me, but on the part of you. It makes perfect sense that this is referencing not Paul's preaching, I hope you see, but rather the reception of the Thessalonians. And that's how I'll take it here this, uh, this morning. What an important facet, brothers and sisters, for a church to be founded upon. And that is full conviction. Unwavering a conviction. And what an important exhortation for us as God's people to hear this. Because we live in a day where convenience, more often than not, wins out over conviction. Does it not? I mean, think of all the advertising campaigns. Think of the culture in which we live. We have a, a culture which a uh, conviction is not important. I didn't inhale or what, whatever. Um, it, you know, what truth doesn't matter. What matters is what I can do. How fast I can give you the product that you want. How fast I move my tail for you. What matters is whether you're pleased. Now, that's the culture in which we live. We can either lament that or, or appreciate that. But the danger comes when that culture creeps into the church. You look around the body of Jesus Christ, the broader church, and, and I see personally an alarming trend in, in the a ministry of God's kingdom where churches are being driven by what is most convenient. What gets the most people to like us? What will enable us to be a successful ministry rather than how God wants us to formulate and form the ministry God's given us? This past week, I read an article by A.W. Tozer describing about how in his day there was this great effort to convert the world. And, and his article basically says, I fear 
after 10 years of the body of Jesus Christ ministering out of convenience and not conviction that the world has converted the church. Brothers and sisters, we are called in Scripture to be a people who do not put our fingers in the air and say, well, what way is the theological trend blowing? We're called to be a people who stand firmly on the truth of God's word. Listen to some passages. Romans 4, speaking of the example of Abraham, who at the call of God left civilization to live as, a, as an alien and stranger, a vagabond. Why? Romans 4, yet with the respect to the promise of God, Abraham did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God, being fully assured, a convicted, that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. Why did Abraham do what he did? He did it because he heard God's word, and he believed it was true. And because it's true, it will, he will therefore live according to it. That's conviction. God's word says it, that settles it, let's live according to it, period. That's the exhortation that Paul gave in Romans 14, verse 5. One man regards one day above another, another regards every day alike. Let each man be fully convinced in his own mind. Paul says, brothers and sisters, do not lick your finger, put it in the air and discern, and from that... I'll conclude what you should decide to do or be. Be a people who are solidly founded upon God's word and what you do therefore springs forth from that. You live out of conviction, not convenience. Years ago when I was in another denomination, we would go to a yearly meeting where the entire denomination would meet. And at that meeting, I typically sat next to the same brothers and every year, one brother, I could count on it, every year at the beginning of the meeting, he would lean over and whisper to me and say, will this be the year that this a denomination places a conviction before convenience? Interesting. We're called to be a people who stand upon the truth of God's word, regardless of how unpopular it may be or popular. It doesn't matter. What matters is we are being faithful to our Lord. And thus became a source of prayer for Epaphras. Colossians 4, Paul wrote, Epaphras, who's one of your number, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, sends you his greetings, always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers, that you may stand perfect and fully convicted in all the will of God. This man prayed, God, may this church be a people who stand firmly upon your word and act according to conviction, to principle, to what God's word says, rather than what their culture around them would have them uh, to be. That was the Thessalonians. Paul says in our passage, brothers and sisters, that, 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 that they were a people who received the gospel with complete, total abandonment and conviction. In other words, they didn't do what they did because they thought it would please people. They did what they did because they knew it pleased God. Here I stand, I will do none other, says the Thessalonians. There's a story I know most of you have used, probably or heard in the context of evangelism when you try to share what does it mean to have saving faith. You know the story of the tightrope walker of the Grand Canyon? attached to, to, uh, to the wall. He's out there doing flips and cartwheels and all kinds of crazy things. And a, a crowd gathers around this, this tightrope. And, and he comes off after uh, some time and he looks at a person and picks up this, cart, this uh, wheelbarrow and says, hey, do you believe that I could have you sit in this and I could wheel you across this rope and back? Do you believe that? And the guy said, yeah, I, I do. I do believe that. And he said, Gideon. Brothers and sisters, that's what the Thessalonians did. Paul came preaching the kingdom of God. Look at verses 9 and 10. And if you want, read the rest of the epistle in second. And you'll read what Paul came teaching and preaching. And you know what, brothers and sisters? Without equivocation, this church got in. You see it in verse 6. Notice with me, 6, the end of 6. You also became imitators of us and of the Lord. Isn't that incredible? Paul says, man, there was, there was feet to their Yes, I want Jesus. They said, I want Jesus, and we're going to do exactly what we need to do. And because Paul did exactly what he needed to do, they became imitators. 
They became little Pauls, little Christs. Not just in word, but in deed. Do you see that in verse 6? In the midst of great tribulation. The word for tribulation there is thalipsis. It's the word used in wine, uh, a winemaking. You know it very well now. It's the pressure needed to burst a grape. So these, this, this body was under severe pressure to remain faithful to Zeus. Faithful to their gods. Uh, remember, there were a good 20 different primary deities of Thessalonica. It was a, a town steeped in idolatry. And there was enormous pressure for them to remain faithful to those gods. As we're going to see, there's a reason why. Because in that day, in Greece especially, there was what is known as trade guilds. And to be a part of a trade guild meant that whatever you made would be sold. So imagine I'm a powerful guy, and I go, look, I brokered five or six agreements with different people to buy these different pots. Now, if you want to join my trade guild, I'll guarantee you that your pots will be sold. In fact, I'll take them, and we'll sell them, and you'll get paid. Now, if you're not part of my trade guild or any guild, no one's buying your product. So what would you do? Well, you'd join a trade guild. But to join a, a trade guild in that day, you had to sacrifice to the local deity, the deity of that trade guild. So when these people became Christians, they lost their livelihood. They no longer could participate in the trade guild. When they became Christians, they went out and they beat Paul to the very cities preaching Christ. When this church was saved, they stood firm in the confession that Jesus Christ is Lord, looking for and hastening the day of Christ's return. Brothers and sisters, they were converted with a conviction. Strong, solid a conviction. First Thessalonians 2, uh, 13. Just go to chapter 2. For this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you receive from us the word of God's message, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work. That means they acted upon it. Which also performs its work in you who believe. Brothers and sisters, this was not a... a yeah, 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 I'll do it. Yes, 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 I love Jesus. Now don't impact my life. This was a church. What made this church so unique, so special, what made this church healthy was that this church acted upon the truth that they professed. Family of God, if Bethel Presbyterian Church is going to be a church that's healthy, we must, as the day goes by, we must cultivate a heart that acts upon the truth of his word. That means we must know the truth of God's word. And we must know it or, or study it, learn it uh, together with the intent to live it out. God's word says it, that settles it. You know, there's a fruit to that. If you and I made that subtle change in our lives, there would be a huge fruit. Uh, Colossians 2, listen to it. This is Paul's burden for the church in Colossae. I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf and for those who are at Laodicea. For all those who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love and attaining to the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding. He wants them to attain the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding. In other words, I want churches to reap the fruit of living by conviction. You go, what is that fruit? Well, you see it in Thessalonica. It's the ability to face the persecutor and genuinely be concerned for their soul, even though they're hurting you. It's to, in the ancient world, to accept joyfully the seizure of your property. Hebrews 10, knowing fully that you have, that's, that's conviction, knowing fully that you have for yourselves a better a possession and an abiding one. It's living in, in an era where the, the Caesar would seek your death, and yet you praying for that Caesar. When all the other uh, religious groups are praying for his condemnation, you're praying for his salvation. Standing firm when the world's going left and you're going to go right. That, brothers and sisters, um, is what conviction is all about. 
It's knowing the, the love of Christ in a world which is on shaky and shifty sand. Family of God, if Bethel is going to be a healthy church, we've got to be this people. And thus, I exhort you as we pass on to the next point. May I encourage you? Do a whiteboard examination of your life. Do it with your wife. Do it with brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. But at least do it. Do it with your kids. Do it with your... Do it. Where you look at your life and say, why am I doing what I'm doing? Ought I to have family devotions? Ought I? If I ought, then I will. Ought I to be this kind of a husband? Ought I to be this kind of a worker? If I am, then I will. Take apart your life, brothers and sisters. Yes, this will be a four or five week grueling exercise. But take, dismantle what you're doing and ask yourself, why am I doing it? Or why aren't I doing it? Let me ask you something. If you could go back in time to the Christian you were at the hottest, most devout time in your life, would you look at your life today and say, compromise, or would you be pleased with what you've seen? If you would not be pleased, this is the time for you to say, what must change in my life for me to embody a, uh, a servant in Jesus Christ? What must our relationship look like? What must my relationship with this body look like? Et cetera, et cetera. Let us be a people who, without apology, stand firm on the truth of God's word. But to do that, it requires us to do more than just simply live out of convenience. That's how we live most of our lives. When David, years ago, my son was being recruited at the Naval Academy, and, and, and when we were there, he wasn't sure whether he would go. He was flown there, and, and, and there was a little bit of pressure to say yes. And so I told him, Dave, say yes. And in the process of praying and deliberation, if you wake up and decide, no, Dad, I don't want to go into the military, then you can later on say no. But at this point, you want to do it. You think you want to do it. He just wasn't passionate. But then again, that's not David, he's not passionate. So he just wasn't, so I said, you know, honey, just say yes. And we can, you can pray about it and think about it more, on, you know, on and on. So, so he said, yes, I want to do that. He came home and he started doing all the process to go into the military. And he did exactly what I was fearing he would do. And that is he just, I thought, got caught up in doing all that he's supposed to do. Doing the next thing. Next thing, I got to get this document in. Go get the document in. Next thing, physical. Go get a physical. So at one point, I stopped and said, Dave, I want to stop you a second. Are you doing what you're doing because you want to do it? Or are you doing what you're doing because it's the next thing on the list? He said, Dad, thanks for asking. I'm doing it because I want to do it. Great. But my fear is, brothers and sisters, if you're like me, you get caught up in doing the next thing on the list. Next thing, Monday, work, go to work. Next thing, work's done, go home. What's next? Dinner, get dinner going. Dinner done, clean it up. Next thing next, what? Free time, what do I do on free time? Read, watch TV, whatever. Next thing next. As opposed to looking at your life and saying, what does God want his Christian, Greg Thurston, whatever your name is, to be or to do or to think in Christ. Let's be a people of conviction. Notice, sec, uh, uh, fifthly, another foundational mark of this church, they had godly leaders. Notice five again. Just as you know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. I just referenced this. I'll reference it again. There were pleaders with the cause in the ancient world. Everywhere you went in Paul's day, you'd go to most cities and there'd be people sitting in the town or standing in the town square trying to get your money by either debating or um, arguing or whatever. But they're trying to get followers, disciples, and through that they made their living. So there were many pleaders with the cause who clearly were out for one thing and one thing only, and that was money. Because of that, it shows you the heart of Paul. The Bible is very clear. The ox, don't muzzle the ox while it threshes. Support those who labor amongst you hard at preaching and teaching. That's a biblical principle. You know what Paul said? Lest I come to Thessalonica, or any city for that matter, 
and be confused with the pleader with a cause and therefore defame the gospel, the glorious gospel of Christ. I will not accept any support from the churches I'm ministering to in that city. Listen to 1 Corinthians 9. He told the Corinthians, if we sowed spiritual things in you, is it too much if we should reap material things from you? If others share that right over you, do we not more? Nevertheless, we did not use that right. We didn't claim it. But we endured all things that we may cause no hindrance to the gospel of Christ. Brothers and sisters, Paul was a man of God. What drove him in his ministry was the concern of Christ. You know what godliness is? Easily defined, brothers and sisters. Godliness versus holiness. I always wonder, what does it mean? Holiness refers to being set apart unto God and therefore your position and the consequent conduct. So holiness would be what you do, but also understanding what I am. A saint is someone who's been set aside by God for his purpose. That's why we're all saints in Christ. That's a holy one. Godliness speaks of motive. We can read the word of God because that's what pleases people. We can read the word of God because that's what you do if you want to be a faithful young man. I can read God's word because if I do, I get, a, I get another mark on my list and I get this, you know, a prize when I go to, you know, Juana's. I can read God's word for five different, 20 different reasons. But if I'm not doing it out of love for God, it's not godliness. Godliness is any action moved out of love for God. Many religious activities, brothers and sisters, we do, we perpetrate in the name of Jesus Christ, but how much of it is, is out of love? Insofar it is out of love, you are a godly person. Insofar it's to, to please people, to conform, to make people like you, that is not godliness, brothers and sisters. We call that being a Pharisee. Godliness is doing it because you love Christ. Paul was a man who what he did, he did out of love for Jesus Christ. Acts 20, I've coveted no one's silver. Now he's, Luke is describing Paul. This is a, a, a speech. So, so imagine Paul. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or clothes. You yourselves know that with these hands I ministered with my own hands and I provided for the people who were with me. I never once took a penny from you, he told the elders. In fact, I labored with these hands to support me and everyone with me. Why? Because I did not want God and his message to be confused with the messages of the pleaders with a, a cause. And thus, we see, man, this man was a man of God, driven out of love for Christ. You see in Thessalonica, chapter 2, it's, Paul describes himself and his ministry amongst them. Would you notice with me verse 5? Paul said, we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor do we seek glory from men, either from you or from others. Even though as apostles of Christ, we might have asserted our authority, but we prove to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Paul says, bear me witness. We were men of integrity, men of Christ, men of God. In fact, he goes on in this chapter, he said that his ministry came at no cost or burden to the Thessalonians, verse 9. You can read it. It was done in integrity. There was absolutely no ground for any in Thessalonica to question Paul's sincerity, objective, or intent, verse 10. In fact, his objective had nothing to do with himself, but everything to do with the Thessalonians following God. Notice 11 and 12. Just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father would his own, ch own children so that you would give us money. So that you would follow our cause. No. So that you would walk in a manner worthy of God. This church was founded upon godly examples. And thus Paul says, you know what kind of men we proved to be among you? Thus you became imitators of us. And you know what? Paul went there knowing that, that he was going to be that example. That Christianity is as much taught as it is wrought. Did I say that right? It's wrought as well as being taught. Or caught, right? It's caught as well. Notice um, the very end of verse 5 
of verse 1 of chapter 1. Notice he says, you know, just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. You see that little phrase? It's a big one. Paul went there knowing that everything that we do is for the glory of God and the benefit of these people. So he purposed to be an example. He knew he was an example to this church. A godly example. Family of God, if you don't realize you are an example, you're missing the boat. I don't care how old you are or how young you are. Children, older brothers and sisters, you've been called to be an example to your younger brothers and sisters. You realize that. God will hold you accountable. It's not a game. We're all called to be an example to the body of Jesus Christ. In this context, I always think, imagine if I got up here and preached a sermon and said, you know, Jesus Christ isn't God after all. Or God's kingdom isn't worth it. Or God's an idiot. Imagine if I did that, I would guess every one of you would either be upset, you'd leave, or both. <laughs> Rightly so. But do you understand that that's the sermons we preach oftentimes by our bad example. We tell our children, why pray when you can worry? Right? That's the book of Delusions 3, verse 4. Why pray when you can worry? Mom, Dad, what's wrong? Oh, man, this is happening, and if this doesn't go right, things are going to go bad. Yeah. You know, man, we got to worry with Mom and Dad. Oh, as opposed to saying, man... Things are bad, but let's pray. We're examples, brothers and sisters. I love the words of Baxter in this regard. As long as men have eyes, it's in your bulletin. As well as ears, they, they will think they see your meaning as well as hear it. And they are apter to believe their sight than their hearing as being the more perfect senses of the two. All that a minister does is a kind of preaching. And if you live a covetous or careless life, you preach these sins to your people by your practice. The church in Thessalonica had godly examples. Brothers and sisters, we are godly examples. We're called to be examples of Christ to one another. In that regard, therefore, elders and deacons, if this point doesn't make you feel a little uncomfortable, you're not listening. Because if anything, elders and deacons are called to be examples to the flock of God. 1 Peter 3, or 5, 3. We're called to be examples to the body of Jesus Christ. In this regard, I want to exhort every one of you. Do you have an example in your mind that you're patterning your walk after? Is it a leader at Bethel? I hope it is. If not, it doesn't matter. But do you have a mature man or woman of Christ after which you're patterning your life. You should. That's a part of being a healthy church. If you do, name who that person is in your mind. And if you've not yet, go out with them. Ask them about their walk. Ask them about their prayer life. Ask them if they're married about marriage. Ask them about parenting. If they're kids, ask them about what it means to submit to parents. We're we'll a people who emulate Christ to one another, and we're to have people whom we emulate. David said it, King David, who wrote God's word, he who walks in a blameless way is the one who will minister to me. David's standard, they have to have a blameless walk. If they don't have a blameless walk, I won't listen to them. But I'm going to find people who have a blameless walk. Those are the ones I'm choosing to be, to be servants of my soul. Hebrews 13, 7, remember those who led you? who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. Are you imitating the faith of brothers and sisters in Christ? You must, brothers and sisters. We must be a people of conviction who stand upon God's word without apology. And brothers and sisters, it's important that you and I have people who are incarnating what it means to live in light of a sovereign God, a loving God, a gracious God. And if not that, who are incarnating what it means to repent when they fail. Don't follow perfect men or women. You'll never find them. Find men who deal with their sin biblically and follow them. Notice with me that brings us to the last point, the last element, assurance. 6B, 
Paul said, you also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. This verse is two things. One, the Thessalonians did not have an easy go of it when they started. In fact, they had a hard go. From the get-go, ready? On your marks, get set. Pew! From the get-go, they were under great pressure. The moment they got out of those blocks, 400-pound weight jumped on their back. And that weight was a weight saying, don't defect from your local deity. Don't embarrass your family. Don't be a fool. Don't lose your uh, cash cow by not worshiping the gods of your, of your trade guild. This 400-pound weight on every one of them. Don't share your faith. You'll be a fool. Don't do this. Do do that. They started with great pressure and tribulation, as he says it here. But yet, brothers and sisters, none of it phased them. Look at the text. It didn't phase them. In fact, it was so amazing, Paul went around, as we've seen, and shared this testimony. We see in Second uh, Thessalonians, he says, man, I've already quoted it. Everywhere I go, I talk about you. I brag about you. I, uh, really, I brag about God, what he's done in you. This is how it should be done. This didn't phase him. Why did it phase him? Why is it that the paper cuts of life seem to phase us, but it didn't phase them? Not the paper cuts, but the hackings of the world. It didn't even phase them. Why? Well, notice the verse again. Having received the word in much tribulation, the last phrase, with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Family of God didn't phase them because they had the joy that came from the Spirit of God. What is that? Well, it's not happiness. Let's start there. It is not happiness. Happiness is based upon your circumstances. In fact, the Anglo-Saxon root of happiness is happenstance, which is the word for circumstance, right? So it's not happiness. You could be on death row five minutes or, or, or five hours away from your pers uh, um, execution, and if you had a surprise visit from your mom and dad and your brothers and sisters, everyone that you loved, they showed up in your prison cell, you would be happy, even though you're going to die in five hours. Happiness is based upon circumstance. Joy is not happiness. What is biblical joy? Biblical joy is defined as the deep-seated conviction that it's well with your soul before God. That's joy. If you believe this day that it is well with your soul before God, I, um, label that joy. You say, but it didn't give me warm fuzzies. It didn't make me smile. I didn't leap for joy. Well, that doesn't mean you don't have it. Joy is the conviction that it's well with your soul before God. I put it this way. If you know Christ, and so know that your sins have been paid in full, you stand before God and perfect in Christ, that you will never know the condemnation of God, and that on the day of judgment, God will welcome you into his kingdom, that in the here and now, you have the, the conviction that it is well with your soul. And you know what we call that a conviction? Assurance. You've got assurance. It's well with my soul. It springs from joy. Gordon Fee wrote it. You've got the, the, the quote there. Life as a pagan may have had its moments of happiness, as it does for humanity in general, but by and large, it was for them a life of heaviness and toil, arid in religion and empty in personal fu uh, fulfillment, especially for the slaves and poor freedmen who would have made up a large sector of the typical early Christian congregation. But in coming to Christ and thus receiving the Holy Spirit, they had been filled with such an unparalleled joy. This is one characteristic of their life in the Spirit that Paul recalls for them as clear evidence of their conversion. How do I know that you're saved? Because you've got assurance. You know it's well with your soul before God. Now get this, brothers and sisters, because God's eternal and his kingdom's eternal, and everything in this world, it's temporal, passing, weak, shallow, ethereal, really. To sit in this world with the knowledge that you have in Christ inherited eternal life can have you look at the big C, cancer, the big L, layoff, name it, the big T, tragedy, any tragedy, 
and say, yes, that hurts. And yes, I'm going to grieve. But let me tell you something. I'm on a rock that cannot be moved. Before God Almighty, this infinite, eternal, unchangeable being, it is well with my soul. He loves me and will never change. He's placed his hands upon me and will never let me go. He walks beside me, before me, within me, forevermore. Nothing, therefore, in this world can be a burden in comparison to what I've got in Christ. That's the words of Tozer. The man who comes to a right belief about God via the gospel is relieved of 10,000 temporal problems, for he sees at once that these have to do with matters which at most cannot concern him for very long. Family of God die of cancer over a 20-year period and compare that uh, cross-bearing to an eternity of serving with Christ. And you will agree, 20 years is a small amount of time to live eternally with God. Assurance. This church was healthy because they walked around knowing that it was well with their soul. Now, where does this assurance come from? Twofold. One, the Spirit of God. It's a gift that comes from the Spirit of of God. So think of what Paul said, the Spirit um, um, you know, uh, testifies to us that we are sons of God. Indeed he does. It's a gift of the Spirit. However, because it's a gift, we say not everyone has that gift. We recognize that. Recognize this though, brothers and sisters. This is a facet of assurance which is rarely uh, recognized. It is a gift of the Spirit, but it also is a product of Christian service. It can be a product of Christian service. Listen to Hebrews 6, 10 through 12. You know 610 because I use a lot when I thank you for ministering God's kingdom in an email or letter. I always type Hebrews 610. God is not unjust. So as to forget your work and the love which you have shown towards his name and having ministered and still ministering to the saints. Love that verse. But I love verses 11 and 12. God's not unjust to forget all the things you're doing in the name of Christ out of godliness for him. And... He goes on. We desire that each one of you show the same diligence. Keep it up. So as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. He says, I want all of you to continue to give your life up on the altar of the service in God's kingdom. Because I want you to know the fruit of assurance that comes from serving in God's kingdom. Brothers and sisters, it's amazing. When you lack assurance, the person wonders... How could God save me? They typically are in a process of retrogression, right? They're drawing back. They're going to their uh, cocoon. They're uh, uh, cocooning. How can I be saved? Oh, God. Oh, God. I'm not, why pray? I don't know if I'm saved. Why read? I don't know if I'm saved. Why serve? I just don't know if I'm saved. Brothers and sisters, a core value of Greg Thurston. Let me encourage you all. Create core values. You've heard about... Um, having uh, convictions or what, uh, um, uh, resolutions. Before you write your resolutions, identify your core values as a Christian. One of Greg Thurston's core values is this. I will always trust Jesus Christ as my lamb who takes away my sin. I will always trust him. I will always be in God's word, no matter how uh, shallow I may feel, no matter how hard my head may, may be or my heart, I will always be in God's word. I will always go to church. No matter how bad I feel, by that I mean spiritually, I may be physically ill and I won't. But I, you know, I will not allow how I feel a cold heart to stop me from going to the body of Jesus Christ and worshiping with him. And fourthly, I will always spend my life for God in helping people. Those are core values that I've got. So much so though, I, or, or, or so much so, I say this, if I'm not saved, and that may be, that I will be one of the only people in hell still claiming Christ is my Savior. Because that is a core value of my life. Brothers and sisters, assurance comes. It can come as you give yourself, as you stop thinking about you and give yourself to core values of service in God's kingdom. 
and amazing, miraculous things happen. Have you ever heard it said, you know what? When you teach, you learn twice as much as what people re receive. You know, you, the teacher's always the blessed one. You've heard that, right? So it is with the giving of Christ. I doubt whether I could be saved. Go give Christ away. That won't, assert, that won't prove that you're saved. Of course not. But just go give Christ away. Go talk to people about Jesus Christ. See what happens to those doubts and those fears and those questions of God's love. Go tell, go find a brother or sister who thinks they've sinned so bad God could never love them. Go minister to that brother or sister and assure them that, you, that there's no condemnation for those in Jesus Christ. If you trust Christ, he'll always love you. Go minister to them and say those words and find if that doesn't make you go, wow. That was a silly rut I got into last week. Regardless, God, I love you. Thank you, God. Assurance is a twofold source, the Spirit of God and service in God's ministry. Brothers and sisters, we're done at least for this morning. Six elements to the foundation of a healthy church. I'll tell you this much right now. I think we can positively predict the future of Bethel Presbyterian Church based upon what we've seen and our appropriation of what we've seen in this chapter. I could positively predict whether or not we will be a faithful church in 50 years based upon whether or not the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the saving death of Jesus Christ, and the final judgment is the bedrock of your faith. If the bedrock of your faith is experience or, what you, or what's happened to you, I can positively uh, predict you will not be healthy. I can positively uh, pr uh, predict that if your conversion does not involve daily repentance and faith in Christ, the identity that you are serving God, you're here for the Lord and not for yourself, that you're living for the glorious coming kingdom of Christ, if that's not a part of your uh, conversion, your daily testimony, then brothers and sisters, I can positively uh, predict that, that you will not be as healthy as you could be. I can positively uh, predict that the foundation upon which you are, for, are, are framing your life is not a recognition that God is sovereign and, and in control of what we're doing, election. That you're not founding upon solid teaching, but the, but the premises and, and opinions of man or lifting your finger and hearing what the public thinks. Divine enabling, trusting Christ, clinging to Christ, sitting at his feet as did Mary rather than laboring as did Martha living upon personal a conviction, saying, Lord, I'm going to cultivate a life that everything I do is based upon you. And those areas that are morally neutral, adiaphora, it'll be based upon faith. I do this in faith in God. Fifthly, you've got godly people who you're patterning your life after. You're not an island. You don't come here, put your, your four hours in and go away and spend your week. But you have people who you are going to asking advice. How do you become a man or a woman of God? How do you pray in this situation? How do you? What do you? Why do you? Where do you? And finally, assurance. Brothers and sisters, if your salvation is based upon people's acceptance of you, if your salvation, the sense of your salvation is based upon your choice of God. Well, I chose him. I prayed the sinner's prayer. You will struggle with assurance. But if your assurance is based upon the fact that God from eternity past reconciled you to Jesus Christ according to his own good pleasure, Ephesians 1, Therefore, brothers and sisters, you cannot divorce yourself from Christ. He loves you. He'll never let you go. If you understand that, then you have joy. As subtle as it may be, as, single, as small as it may be, you've got the, the deep-seated conviction that in the end of all things, it is well with my soul. If you've got that, brothers and sisters, you're founded upon a structure that will produce a glowing, glorious place of service in Christ's name. May God give us the grace as, as family members to encourage each other towards this end. Next week, we'll pick it up in verse 3 and what all this produced in this congregation. Let's pray. Father, what a delight it is to look at this description of 
this body who you by your grace brought to um, life in that place and time. Father, we would pray without apology, make us like this. So Lord, do the work. And we realize this prayer is a prayer for our lives to be shaken, disturbed, that we might be moved out of our lethargy and sleeping stupor to ask, what do I believe? And what must I therefore do? What is true? And what must I be? God, to, to begin the process of, of functioning as a healthy church, embodying all these that we've seen. God, we pray without apology, with, with pleading. Make Bethel individually and corporately this kind of people. Brokenness quick to repent, quick to say sorry, quick to forgive, quick to cling to the cross of Jesus Christ. Quick to cling to your word, not caring what the world thinks, not embarrassed by Jesus Christ, but gloriously proud to suffer abuse for the truth of your word, if abuse is what is cast upon us. God, we pray, make us that healthy people. I praise you for this body. I praise you for the desire to love you and found their life upon your word. I praise you for the health of this body. What a wonderful church this is. Pray, oh God. As Paul says, it's not a hard thing to say over and it's a benefit for us all. Rejoice in the Lord always. Lord, I pray that you'd give us the grace, as healthy as we are, to strive still more to be the people you've called us to be. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.